And today's an exciting day. We're starting a new series. We're starting uh, Treasures, Timely and Timeless. And we're talking about all the things in our church that we aren't physically taking with us, but we're still taking with us. And to kick off our, uh, our new series, we're going to be talking about the little symbol on a stained glass window in the chapel called the Epworth League. And the Epworth League was one of the first and largest uh, youth and young adult uh, groups in the Methodist church. And Mike will be explaining it a little bit more. But we're not taking that window and we're not taking the Epworth League symbol, but we are taking 412. And 412 is our uh, youth group. And these kids are doing wonderful things And not only these kids, but these leaders that have stepped up to help and shape these kids' lives and to help teach them about Jesus and pour into these students' lives. These past past couple months, we have been talking about a new series called Shine. And they're sharing their faith and they're reaching out to their friends and they're being an example of exactly what 1 Timothy 4.12 is. And one challenge that we've, two challenges that we've kind of, put out to the kids is we've started to have them pray over their service or pray over 412 so they'll come 15 minutes beforehand and pray and not only have the students done this their leaders have come and started to pray for their service and another thing is we've asked them to pray over their social media and pray for the followers that they have on social media and one young man he has over a thousand followers and he came up to me on wednesday and said I've prayed for everybody that's following me. And so he's prayed for all the thousand people that are following him on social media. And one of our leaders has also said that he started to pray for his social media followers and that he has started to invite friends at work to come to church. So not only is it changing them, the adults are setting examples. Our leaders are taking an initiative. So if you ever see one of the 412 leaders walking around or you see them with their smiling faces, thank them for the, the example that they're being for our youth and what the youth are following for what they're doing. And today we're going to read 1 Timothy 412 as kind of what the basis for 412 came from. So let us read the word of God. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. These are the holy words of God. Let us pray. God, God, today we come to you, and we come to you reading your holy word, your living word. And God, we know that Pastor Mike, he has been reflecting on this piece of scripture for a long time. For when he started 412 and when he chose this name and God and today when he comes in front of the whole congregation to preach on this scripture. Bless our time today as we hear the words that he has been preparing. God, let your spirit flow through this room and open our hearts and ready to hear this message. The message that some of us need to hear today. We thank you for Pastor Mike. We thank you for this church, for the new church. For the people in this room. God, you are good. In your name we pray. Amen. So, you know, uh, over the last, I don't know, long time, eight or ten years it seems like, we've been spending a lot of time on the whole idea of getting there. Of getting from here to the new church. And part of that process is, of course, for you to take home a yard sign. We have about a hundred of them left. So, I mean, it's 150 went out last week. Shove them in your yard. Ground's still soft enough. Maybe until this afternoon to get it in there. Uh, but, but we have spent a lot of time on getting there. But as a staff in our various ministries in the church, we also need to remind ourselves that getting there is not the main thing. We have to plan to do something once there. So we've got to get there. But all of our time now is being spent on once there, sharing the message with Je- of Jesus Christ to this generation. So as Kelsey mentioned, uh, this sermon series is really going to talk about timeless meaning... And a timely message. This is our last sermon series here. And so some of the symbols that you see on the front of your bulletin that point to messages that have always been important to Mary Methodist that we might not be able to take with them, physic- with us physically, but we are definitely taking them with us spiritually. And one of them has to do with a symbol who shows us that our aim has always been to lead Christian children, to, to lead children 
and youth to become Christian disciples. So I'm going to give you a quick history lesson. So throw up that Epworth League uh, stained glass symbol. That is from our chapel. The Epworth League is named after the boyhood home of John Wesley, our denomination's founder in England. It began in the Central Methodist Episcopal Church of Cleveland, Ohio in 1839 with the motto, as you can see from the stained glass window, look up, look up to Jesus and lift up, lift up others. This was the model of the Epworth League. Started in 1839, within its first 10 years, it gained 1.7 million members in the United States which is a significant number because the United States only had a population of 23 million at that time. So nearly 10% of the mem- of the United States citizens were part of the Epworth League. And so it had a huge effect on pop culture. If you may remember in The Music Man, which was written in 1912, a, 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 a movie, a, a play that's set here in Iowa, teenagers, the need of shin, declines a date opportunity because it's Epworth League night. In the novel, My Home Far Away, Epworth League meetings are one of the few social gatherings that the adolescent girl, who is the main character of the book, is able to go to because of its wonderful values. And in W.C. Fields' movie, It's a Gift, he says this, Uncle Ben was getting better, but then he attended the Epworth League picnic and choked to death on an orange. So, you see, (laughs) it sounds like a youth group potluck. (laughs) But, but you see, the, the, the Epworth League was making such a huge cultural difference that it is, was embedded in our culture. In 1930s, at the end of, the, uh, of various mergers uh, from the Methodist Episcopal Church, the church became the Methodist Church, and Epworth League came, became MYF. MYF. Anybody know what MYF stands for? Methodist Youth Fellowship. Some of you were a part of it. We're going to take that quiz in a minute. But from 1939 to 1969, the MYF, which was our was our youth ministry in this and all United Methodist or, or all Methodist churches across the globe. This became known those years, those those 30 or 40, 50 years there as the golden age of Methodist camping, because all these MYFers went to Bible camps during the summer. And we filled up at that time the seven United Methodist or Methodist camps in, in Iowa. Thousands and thousands of kids went there. But in 1968, the Methodist Church merged with a couple other denominations and we became United Methodist. So we became UMYF. That's the generation of Pastor Mike and others. And the motto of UMYF was to learn, learn about Christ, love the world and serve the community. And, and the fodder of MYF was, or UMYF was retreats and Bible studies and social awareness and fundraising. Like the, M- the United Methodist Youth Fellowship opened that window here in the church. It was closed. They, they led a fundraising drive. I know enough about youth that they didn't pay for it all. But they led the motion to get that going. And I remember one of our associate pastors at this church 30 or 40 years ago standing in the youth room. And it's now the parlor saying to us, well, one of our goals in UMYF is for United Methodist kids to meet each other, to fall in love, make United Methodist families. So I don't know how how many of you married somebody from your youth group. There you go. There you go. There's a few of you. All right. That's good. But United Methodist Youth Fellowship at that time were being given territories within the church. I loved it in, in the chapel. That was kind of our screw around room, our mess around room in the chapel. And it was great because if you played pool, your goal was to break. Because if you got to break, you won because all the balls went right in the side pockets. You know, because like all youth group furniture then and now, youth room furniture had spent a lifetime somewhere in someone's house. Then it went from the upstairs to the downstairs, from the downstairs to the garage, in, unless you're in Arkansas. I went to the porch and then it came to the youth group, Right. Somebody from Arkansas was listening. That's good. And, and we were in places in this room, like the basement of the building that's been knocked down now. I, I was talking to somebody at a wedding last night that said they went to youth group in the basement of the old office building. Some of us have been in the Carnegie building. Some of them over here. But, but ministries began to territorialize. And as the world moved from everybody across the world being connected to more localized and individualized mission and ministry so we could sell new cool t-shirts and devise logos and all that, here at our church we became 412 which is our current logo for Marion Methodist Student Ministries. 412, that move from UMYF to 412 came about about eight years ago. 
when Marion Methodist sat down and set as one of its goals to reach 10% of the students in our local high schools for the nature of Jesus Christ, which we think is a very aggressive goal, and we're endeavoring toward it. Now, we had a baseline in defining Scripture, which is what makes the logo, and that is this, which, which Kelsey read a few moments ago. 1 Timothy 4, 11 and 12 says, Command and teach these things. Now, understand this. This is Paul, an older adult, writing to a younger adult, Timothy. That's critical for this. Don't let anyone look down upon you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. Now, I will tell you this because I know it to be true. The youth in 412 play around a little bit. We have a ganga pit down the hall. We have a Wii, which is a, a, a video games. We have, sometimes they play sardines, which is another version of hide and go seek or kick the can in this church. So they play games, but I want to tell you this about 412. There is no playing around there. What she said in this pulpit just a minute ago is the truth of what we do. We don't diddle with religion. We don't nudge up against religion like, like some earlier versions might have done. We teach unyieldingly these things. First, become a believer in Jesus Christ. That is our first and foremost issue, is to become a believer in Jesus Christ, and second, then be an example for your peers. Become a believer first, and become an example of the, uh, to your peers. This is an unapologetic message that we preach here, and I want to make sure that you understand this. The reality is that youth, which is why we have poured ourselves into youth ministry over the years, youth cannot become examples in a vacuum. They not, cannot become this on their own volition. I have said for years, this very important, which I believe is a spiritual truth, that the spiritual life of the young in our congregation are, is directly related to the spiritual life of our adults, which is to say, if our adults are dry and desolate as far as their spiritual life, so will be the youth of our community. If our adults are alive and rich and vibrant in their faith, so will be our youth. Youth cannot become examples without first experiencing one. They cannot become examples to anyone else without experiencing it. They cannot be an example of what they do not know. They need examples to become one. In the months between when I was appointed from Webster City Asbury to become the senior pastor of this church, we bought an, and were finishing the basement of my house. And one of the actions in finishing the basement of that house was we got the carpet down, we had the drywall up. We needed to put the baseboards down. I'd never put baseboards down in my life. And I, unfortunately, as a carpenter, had this expression in my carpentry vocabulary of, oh, that's good enough, right? Which doesn't work with baseboards. So I called upon uh, someone I'd known for a long time. His name's Mel Campbell. He comes to the 945 service. And I said, Mel, can you help me with my baseboards? He says, yeah, let's go measure them. He measured them. And I had 203 feet of baseboard that I needed around the basement of that church. He said, okay, you need to buy 210 feet of product. I'm like, no way. But he's a Rockwell engineer, so there was a way. And Mel showed me how to stain it and, and how to trim it and how to make it go down just right. And to be honest with you, now that it's done and it's been done for 15 years, you go upstairs and you say, whoever did the basement was a lot better than the guys that did the upstairs, which is what we paid for. But I need an example to do that. Because seven years later, I found myself in Nashville, Tennessee, following their flood in 2009. And I'm with a committee or a group of our 412 students and they said, well, we need one of you to take these two students and put down 210 feet of baseboard in that house over there. I'm like, ah, darn, I know how. <laughs> and so do those two boys now, because I had an example that would show me the way. Without an example, how can we know? I needed an example that would patiently and deliberately and thoughtfully Show me. And so do you. And so do our students. So I'm going to take a minute. This will be the uh, aerobic portion of our church service this morning. This will wake up a couple of you, so let's plug back in. If you're able, I'm going to ask you to stand. If you've ever been shown the faith, if you've ever attended one of these ministries, I want you to stand and stay standing right now. If you ever went to Epworth League, if you ever went to MYF, if you've ever been to 412, if you've ever been to UMYF, stand up now, stay standing. That's a whole bunch of us, don't, but don't go away. Stay right there. Now, if you've ever led a small group, taught Sunday school, helped with vacation Bible school, or been a Sunday school teacher or an aide, please stand up and join them. 
if, well, let's not quit yet, if you've ever traveled with one of these groups, even just driving them to the roller rink or you've gone on a mission trip or something with them, stand up. If you've ever contributed money to them or cooked for them or bought something, stand up. Do you get it? Do you get it? Youth are kind of important to this congregation. Thank you. You may be seated. And of course, some of that we get because of this, because our aim is at Marion Methodist to lead children and youth. And this is one of our primary things to become disciples of Jesus Christ. We love our kids in Jesus name. And because of that, please hear this and don't hear what I don't what I'm not saying. Please hear this carefully because I want to word this very carefully. Youth cannot be our heroes. They need heroes to emulate. One of the most disruptive sentences I hear when I go to parties and stuff like that with, with, with people that have high school or junior high kids is in this culture, they will sometimes say this sentence, and I know what they mean, but they'll say, my son is my hero, and it, that can't be right. Not when they're still a kid. I, I understand that sometimes our sons and daughters have extraordinary courage when they're coming up. I understand that sometimes they express themselves in ways that shows a, a moralistic integrity that we're so very proud of. And I never, ever, and every youth in this congregation knows this to be true because I know most all of them. They know that I never, ever, ever would put a youth down. And I know they need heroes. They need leaders, guides, coaches. They don't need the pressure of being our heroes. They cannot withstand it. It is too much for them. They may, as they become adults, become heroic to you, and that's great. But adults of every single age, your age, my age, every age, are called to lead children and youth to become disciples of Christ. And I'm going to make a little call out here, and I don't feel the least bit bad about it. Men, just like Luann said last week, men, I need you. We need you. To deposit your faith in these emerging adults? Because it doesn't take any energy to be a kid. They do that naturally. You didn't really have to work hard when you are a kid, right? You know, that just came, screwing around came to you naturally, right? You say, well, I, it's class. What can I think about other than class, right? You didn't need help in that. But, but men, I want to tell you this. We need to deposit our faith. We need to deposit ourselves in these emerging adults to show them what a Christian man who's living in a minority culture can be. And it might have been a majority culture when you went through Epworth League or MYF, but it is not a majority Christian culture anymore. It is our turn and we are able and we can help. And women, I'm not letting you off on this. We need you to deposit your faith in these emerging adults and show young women what it's like to be a Christian woman in the midst of the Me Too generation. When they're in a minority culture, it's our turn. Be unafraid. You are able. And here's why you're needed. Don't back up from this. In 1985, a movie kind of changed the youth culture. I think it's the most important movie for teachers, youth ministers, others to see. Because it shows in this little video clip, we're just going to show you about 30 seconds, how youth feel when they have no heroes, no examples of what Christian manhood and womanhood is that they can follow. Can you, can you push play on that? Listen carefully. just happens. What happens? When you grow up, your heart dies. Who cares? I care. It's inevitable when you grow up, according to the movie The Breakfast Club, your heart dies. I just want to tell you to the young in this congregation and anybody that's listening on the internet, because I know just as many people watch us online as watch us in real life, to the young people from an old guy, that is not true. That is dead wrong. Our hearts are not dead. You want a witness to know your heart's not dead? We've got a middle class congregation that's raised five and a half million dollars to build a church for the next generation. That is a not a dead place. That's just a little simple example. We want 
We pray for our spiritual fire to blaze in our hearts. We want, we pray for the spiritual fire in the youth and children of our hearts to blaze as ours once did and does today. I admonish those adults among us here today to let your spiritual fire touch the students, the kids of our generation. We have experienced God in real and exciting and spectacular ways. And to withhold that is wrong because the ways we've experienced God can absolutely breathe life into the young. So please, please, please do not withhold it. It has always been the role and the responsibility of the elders of the village to share life, love, wisdom, hope, and faith with those that were trailing behind them. You understand that we are the forefathers and the foremothers of the ones that come behind us. That the timeless and timely truth is that children and youth need living hearts of Christians, adults, right now to follow. So I admonish you, and I don't apologize for any of this, we are to set an example in speech. We have choices in all of these. James says this, now you, you know this to be true. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets... The whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by not good. I had a high school job just down the street from here, actually. And a guy came in on Saturday afternoon into the shop and he needed something made. And I was young. I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really know what I was supposed to do. I knew we made those kind of things, but I was kind of looking at one, trying to figure it out. And I was taking longer to make it than... He thought I should, so he walked behind the counter back into the shop. And he said, you dumb, blah, 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 stupid kid, can't you figure this out? I'll tell you what, those words, st- well, 40 years later, I'm still telling them to you. That left a lasting impact. The way people use their words, and that one left, left a pretty lasting negative impact in my life. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says this, Do not let any wholesome, unwholesome talk come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that if they may benefit, that it may benefit those who listen. Two weeks later, same shop, same place, different thing. Guy came in Saturday afternoon doing a project at his home, asked me to make this thing. I went in the back. I made it. I'm about half done, taking a long time. He walks back there and he says, you look like you're getting it, Mike. Looks like you're figuring it out. You're doing a great job. I want to tell you, the outcome of positive talk is so much heavier. We need to encourage, I need to encourage you, and I want to encourage you to, to use words of encouraging, encouragement to manage and direct your words to God's perspective to help young people in our generation grow up. Breathe good words. Trust me, they're being listened to. They are setting an example for the young because they listen and they see Everything. We're to set an example in our speech and we're also supposed to set an example in our conduct, the very things we do. Philippians 1, 27 says, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as for the one faith of the gospel. Do you know what the band's WWJD mean? Have you ever seen one? Do you know what it means? What would Jesus do? You see him all over the place, right? How in the world can a kid today know what Jesus does unless he's seen Jesus doing things through the life of the adults around him or her? How in the world? These are the things we have to be. We need examples that will stand fast in a culture that needs people to stand fast into my favorite line, I told my Bible study this, uh, this uh, Wednesday night, my favorite line this whole sermon, so get your pens out if you can write this stuff down. We are to make your Christianity so attractive that non-believers be que- begin to question their disbelief. If you're around people that disbelieve, your Christianity should be so attractive that they start saying, man, I probably shouldn't disbelieve Christianity if it's that makes them that happy and that wonderful. You are viewed all the time. Younger people make decisions for or away from Christ based on what they see in you. So live attractive Christianity. Set an example in speech, in conduct, and in love. 
I'm going to go fast up there because I've got to skip some stuff. Too bad for you. Take people just as they are. Loved by God. I had this great example of my father. My father was, in my opinion, one of the greatest men that ever lived. And one of his best skills was he took people just as they came to him. He didn't always agree with what they believed in. He didn't always agree with what they were doing. But he did accept them and love them and care for them the way they are. He wasn't a preacher. He was a guy. You are loved first so that you can love second. That's the action plan of a Christian. Disciples know that they're loved. And we have that confidence to reach to others with it. Love's not a feeling. It's a reality we share through, through action. So set an example in faith. I've got three minutes left. I can do it. Hebrews 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Look at the wisdom. Look at the intelligence. Look at the faith of your life examples. They're not dumb. And I don't believe that my, my congregation's dumb for a minute. I, I believe that we trust in people that we look up to that had wisdom, intelligence, and hope. And we see that they trusted God beyond any shadow of a doubt. And now you are that for someone. And you need to be that for someone. What do they see? Are they seeing your absolute trust? And last, set an example in purity. Matthew 5, 8 says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Man, you're doing a good job, Michael. Thanks for keeping up with me. We receive our purity from Christ, and we need to root out all impurity, because a little impurity can be disastrous. A couple of years ago, I was at the Linmar Fellowship of Christian Athletes. That's a thing that happens before school. And I was to give a little talk, and we were talking about impurity. So I, so I took a half gallon of strawberry yogurt and dumped it into a, a bowl, a glass bowl, and said, who would like to have a bite of this? And one of the kids, real athletic, fairly, fairly famous at that time in the Lindmark culture, we stirred it up, and he took a bite of it. Delicious, right? And I said, it's pretty good, right? And I said, would you take another bite? And he said, yes. I said, hold on, I want to make a little thought here. I said, you know how you guys tell me all the time, you come up to me and say, hey, this joke, I want to tell you a joke and it's not that bad. Or I want to tell you something that happened, it's not that bad. I want to tell you that it's already told, you've already told me what it is. And so what I did is, I had a little about a, about a pencil eraser sized piece of my neighbor's dog's leftovers. <laughs> in a Ziploc. And I dumped it in there and I stirred it up. And I said, take a bite of that. He's like, no way. I'm like, why? He says, because there's dog poop in it. I said, just a little bit. It can't ruin it all. He says, it does ruin it all. I said, exactly. And that's what impurity does in our life. You put a little impurity in your life, regardless of what it is, and it can ruin the whole thing. Philippians 4.8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Set your course on the good and stay on the course for the good. And that's a persistent choice. You can set your course one time, but staying on it, that's an every single day, every single decision made. This is a timeless meaning with a timely message. The church is perpetuated perpetuated by faithful examples. So adults, be one in the name of Jesus. And youth, you work on becoming one. I say all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Lord, we come to these moments every week when we pause to thank you and ask you to accept these gifts that we've placed in the offering plates. And just because we do it every week doesn't mean that we should uh, see it as routine, as ordinary, because it's anything but. Lord, these are our moments to thank you, the God of the universe, for all of the wonderful things that you have done, the wonderful person and, and being that you are, and the many ways in which you interact into our lives. And, and our small token of thanks, we just ask that you accept that, that you use that, that we can be a part of the ministries and the different things that will happen as you build your kingdom in this place and around the world. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for letting us be a part of that. Thank you for letting us take these moments. And thank you for uh, just giving us the hearts to, and the abilities to be able to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now go and serve the Lord this week. Be that example that people are looking for, the example of Christ in their lives. Go in peace. You noticed in your bulletin today we're going to take a few minutes right now. Um, one of the things that we learned as a staff and as a building committee as we go forward into this portion of our project that we've put out a lot of information and we also understand that a lot of your learning of that information is at the end of your questions, not the end of our sending. So we're going to, I just started a timer, so we're going to take a few minutes here, four minutes for questions uh, and answers about our next building. So if you have some, I'll answer them. And if you don't, we'll go on to the next thing. Yes, ma'am. What's going to happen to what? The organ, thank you. Um, our real answer is we're, we're going to sell that with the building, unless someone wants it. Um, it's a very old organ, and it's in significantly hard to repair. We, it's hard to repair. We have an instrument that's coming, that's name I should know, that has foot pedals. It's not an organ, but it'll give us organ-like sounds. Do you know the name of that instrument? It's a Dexabel. A Dexabel. And uh, unless we'd have told you, you'd have thought we had an organ out there. So it's going to be nice. But that organ doesn't have any value at all on the market, except there's a guy that has what I call the Van Dyke of organs. And if anybody wants it, he'll probably come cannibalize it for parts. Good question, though, because it's beloved. Other questions? Yes, Steve. It is not. <laughs> if, if we were going like that, it would be fifth. And this would be fourth, so uh, it's going to be Mary Memphis, just like now. It's way in the back. When do we get the cross put up? Thank you for asking that. When do we get the cross put up, which is the question. There will be a, an 8-inch wide cross that's 18 feet tall that goes on top of the spire that's there now. It will be put out in the next uh, few months. That's kind of timed out in the sense that we don't want it there too far before we get there because once you put the cross up, people say it's time to come and we want the visitors to come once we can get in there. So that's, uh, Nesper Sign is making it and it's going to be really cool. It's going to be right at the maximum limit before you have to have a red blinking light on top of it. Yes, sir. Um, that's, that's kind of a matter of, uh, kind of decision making on what memorial committees and others have said we've taken so that's why we've asked people to come with us and then sub things uh, the question was what art is being given away um, we're discerning through the trustees of what's going in the new building some art is going back to those that gave it in memorials and uh, other things so we're, we're tending not to have a rummage sale for our art but some art has gone like there was a piece of art in the um, <clears throat> chapel for the longest period of time that was actually the result of a mission trip um, and those students are uh, now about 15 years younger than me and one of them asked for it and I said you bet because that, that's not something that would be going with us to the new building things like that yes uh, I'm going to go here first the banners are actually going back to the donor they've requested them Yes, ma'am. What about the stained glass windows that we're taking out? Beautiful. Good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that will not probably be done at the same time as our building is done, but the foundation for it will be done. They're being rebuilt. 
um, the Jesus window needed to be completely rebuilt. It had never been uh, redone during the history of its time in the building. It's being redone along with this one that's being cleaned up in Fairfield. Uh, the Moses window is being cleaned up. It doesn't really need to have any repairs done to it. They'll be placed in the standards that if you walk up to the front. So when you go out there today to pray. Okay. And you're looking at the front of it. Okay, well, time's up. I gotta go. No, I, when you, if you look to the left, you'll see of the front door, you'll see the spire. And centered on the middle wall of the sanctuary, eight feet out from the building, is where the stained glass windows will be. Okay. That's your four minutes. They'll come back every week to do that. If you have questions that you feel might not get answered live, put them on the yellow sheets. Uh, put them in the offering plate. We'll seek to do them for now. Let's get up and let's bless each other in the name of Jesus. Offer handshakes, hugs, high fives, all that.